Welcome everyone to Kani Conversation. Um, I'm Diane Lipscomb. I direct the Kani Institute for Brain Science and joining me today is Chris Moore, who is our Associate Director and um, our special guests, uh, Stephanie Jones and Frederica Pechner. As we have before, um, what we've done for um, you today is to pick a, a couple of uh, amazing um, brain scientists to talk about some topical issues connected to things that we um, are very passionate about. And so uh, Dr. Stephanie Jones and Rike Peschner use computational modeling as an active method in understanding uh, human brain in health and disease and to kind of get inside that black box uh, that, that really defines us as humans, our mind and brain. So I'm really very excited um, to jump into conversation with them. I'm going to introduce them just uh, quickly, but I do want to point out that as before, um, we really do hope that you'll join us um, and participate in the conversation. And you can uh, use the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen to post questions. And then Chris and I will take turns to get to your questions and pose them to Steph and Rike. Okay, great. So let me introduce our special guests. Um, so Rike Peschner just joined Brown um, in uh, the Kearney Institute Center for Computational Brain Science as our inaugural Kearney Fellow and also Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior. Now, uh, although COVID-related visa and travel issues mean that we have to wait a bit longer to have Frederica join us in person, as you can tell, she's already very intimately engaged in um, Brown and uh, doing so remotely, as of course, most of you are doing um, today. The Peschner Lab translates neuroscientific research into useful applications that pr promote mental health and to support individualized diagnoses and enable targeted treatment for mental disorders. Uh, she uh, and her lab combine math with state-of-the-art neuroimaging in the field of perception, learning, and decision-making. Uh, Rike has a really interesting background, uh, obtaining her Master's of Science uh, degree in physics at the University of Würzburg and a PhD in neuroscience at the Graduate School of Systemic Neuroscience uh, at Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. It's a really rich background, a background in physics and applying that to understanding very complex features of, of the human brain. Stephanie Jones is an associate professor in neuroscience at Brown. And Steph is also intimately connected with the Kearney Computational Center in Brain Science. The Jones Lab combines experimental and theoretical techniques to study human brain dynamics. And Steph Jones uh, received her BA and MA in mathematics with a minor in computer science from Boston College and a PhD from Boston University in dynamical systems theory and computational neuroscience. And Steph was just awarded this really great prize called the Biomag 2020 Mid-Career Award for brilliant approaches to bridging cellular network level circuitry modeling to understanding what the whole brain does. So um, very, uh, both of these really amazing scientists applying mathematical computational approaches to understanding brain function. Okay, so after that long introduction, um, I'm gonna now kind of turn to uh, Steph and Enrique and ask them, just to give um, each of them kind of give a snapshot of their backgrounds and what led them into their current research uh, interests. Um, and maybe just give a small example of, of what you do, what, what's your passion, what kind of research are you up to? And I'll start with Steph. Take it away, Steph. All right, so thank you, Diane. Thanks so much for that really nice introduction and for the opportunity to be part of this conversation and especially with Rike, whose work I admire very much and I'm looking forward to conversing about. Um, so my background into this field of computational neuroscience, I would say was fairly unpredictable in the sense that if you had asked me when I was an undergraduate starting and studying mathematics, if I might like to do computational neuroscience, I would say computational what? 
I had no idea that the field even existed when I started. Um, and so it's been a really interesting journey to where I am today. And to just give you a brief snapshot of that. So I started in mathematics and computer science at Boston College as an undergraduate. And I got really excited about this field called dynamical systems theory and chaotic dynamics, which I thought, wow, we can put a mathematical structure on things that are chaotic. Um, and decided, okay, I'm gonna go to graduate school to learn more about this field um, and to maybe become a professor and to teach it to others because that was a path that I saw forward. But when I was at graduate school, they which was at Boston University in the math department there, one of the professors started this program called the Center for Biodynamics, where they started to apply dynamical systems theories to biological questions. And one of those questions was in neuroscience. And that really changed my complete path forward because I didn't even know that you could apply math to understand neuroscience. I knew very little about neuroscience at that point. And so I got the bug and I, I transitioned from my advisor in chaotic dynamics to Nancy Capel, who at that time, I didn't know that Nancy was a very famous mathematician doing neuroscience research. And so I felt really fortunate at this time in my career to have, have heard, had said yes to working with me. Um, and so in graduate school, I started building these small models of neural networks to describe the electrical activity of neurons. And we used models that were really mathematically tractable because we were doing hardcore math on them. And so I was studying the motor system, the central pattern generating system of the crayfish um, and using these small networks, again, that describe the electrical interactions of excitatory and inhibitory nels, neurons in this crayfish CPG. And that was great, but by the time I finished, I really had the neuroscience bug and I really realized, wow, this field that I'm in is emerging and there's something really unique that I can bring to the table having this background in mathematics, but I know really nothing about neuroscience. I know nothing about the human brain. And so I took this opportunity at Mass General to have a postdoc. Um, and at Mass General, I was exposed to human brain imaging. I learned how to collect data, MEG and EEG data. Importantly, I learned how those signals were generated, how to analyze the data. And at that point, my whole modeling framework transitioned because I realized these simplified models that I was using weren't adequate to describe this signal that we were studying that was in, embedded in the biophysics of the brain that I now knew much more about. And so I started developing these really detailed models of brain circuits that could account for the biophysical generation of these signals that we were recording in humans, particularly MEG and EEG. Um, and we started to study things like somatosensory perception and attention in collaboration with Chris Moore. And so I started to apply this modeling framework to really some of the most dominant signals that you get with MEG and EEG, which are brain rhythms. And so when you record outside of the head, one of the main things you see are these oscillations in the electrical signatures of the brain. And so I started to apply this modeling framework to really understand from a mechanistic level, how are the neurons in the brain creating this oscillation? And why is this oscillation important for brain function? Um, and it turns out that one oscillation in particular, this alpha frequency oscillation, which was one of the first brain oscillations recorded, is really implicated to be involved in attention. The power of this rhythm shifts when you attend to the representation in the body, and that helps with perceiving sensory stimulation. And so we've been developing this framework to understand these human signals for a decade. Um, and most recently, we've turned it into a software. And so we're trying to now teach the community how to engage with these detailed models to try to interpret, well, where do these EEG signals come from in the brain? And if we can understand where we, they come from, maybe we can un understand better how to manipulate them or perturb them with um, interventions to normalize, disrupt brain function. So that perhaps great. wasn't a brief intro, but that is- No, it's great. It's great. Thanks, Ted. <laughs> Perfect. Um... Rike, let me turn to you. Yes, uh, absolutely brilliant. It's always uh, wonderful to hear how people get into the field. Um, and I see a lot of overlap, in fact, um, which is also often very encouraging. Um, so my background is in physics. Uh, I did not always know that I want to study physics. In fact, I was thinking between psychology, philosophy, and physics. Um, I had a really good teacher. That's often the story, right? I had a good physics teacher. And, but then I went to a test day at university um, where they, it was a girl's day for physics and they were trying to kind of lure you into physics and it was terrible. 
And after that day, I was actually, you know, considering whether I should do it or not, because I really felt I did not fulfill the stereotype at all. Um, I still decided to do it. And I think for two reasons, one was purely intellectual and the other one was probably more pragmatic. Um, the intellectual reason was that I always felt that physics is going to provide the answer to all of my questions about kind of what keeps the world together in its most inner parts. And that's a very Goethean thought for a German. Um, in German, it would be was die Welt im Innersten zusammenhält. So trying to understand how kind of, you know, matter is composed of atoms and how that makes up human bodies and so forth. Um, and the other reason was pragmatic because I feel that you often make decisions in life that um, bring you into a new room. And that means you're opening up new doors, but you're also closing doors behind you. And some decisions, they bring you in a room where you open up more doors than you close. And other decisions, they bring you in a room where you're closing more doors than you open. And so your path becomes more narrow. And I always liked decisions that bring me in a room where more doors open up. And I felt physics is like that. You know, if you study physics, you learn problem solving. So afterwards, you can do anything. You can go into consulting or you may be able to go into science. Um, so there are... I felt, you know, your path is open into the future. And, uh, and actually it has proven to be true. Um, and so in my master's was the first time I actually even heard about neuroscience because I had to give a talk about how you can build a neuron from transistors. Um, and then I realized there's this whole applied field of neuroscience and I felt physics isn't that applied anymore because um, experimental physics was so much around you know, battery development and matter um, improvement, but not really, not answering the big questions in life anymore. At least that's what I felt. And so I realized I want to do neuroscience, but I have no idea about biology. I had no idea about psychology and I needed some training. And that's why I applied for a graduate school because I thought, you know, you have lecturers, you get to learn this. And I was worried I would not get in because I'm a physicist, but the opposite is true. Um, they were quite eager to get people with a mathematical background. And that was an experience I kept having over and over again, in fact. Um, and I started to study how humans perceive uh, space and time. Um, so it's somewhat related to physics. Um, and from there, I realized that I want to go more into the application. And one of the clear applications is not just to study um, how a healthy brain might perceive the world, but what happens if perception goes abroad. And um, that's why I started to look at mental disorders and particularly maladaptive decision-making and maladaptive perception. And one of the areas I got into was um, gambling addiction, in fact, pathological gambling. Um, and while I worked on this, um, in this whole field of computational psychiatry that has a uh, kind of, growing uh, over the past five to 10 years uh, increasingly. Um, I noticed that we tend to look at mental disorders with a very strong focus on the brain. But when you look at the actual symptoms that you see, then a lot of the symptoms are actually somatic in nature. So there's always this interaction between the body and the brain. And um, for instance, in depression, I think it's at least five of the major symptoms are somewhat, you know, related to your body, yeah, changes in appetite or changes um, in like, you know, somatic problems, so forth. And so um, I realized that we need to take the body into account when we want to study these issues. And this is how I got into this question of how do we perceive our bodies? Because a large chunk of what the brain is actually doing is trying to keep us alive. And keeping us alive means keeping our heart beating, making sure that metabolism is working. And only once all of this is in place, we can start thinking and, you know, do science or go out and have fun. And so um, it's clear to me that as an integrative part of the computations that have taken place in the brain is computing states of the body. And this is how I really got into this field of interception or you can call it computational psychosomatics. And that's also what I'm studying now. And at Brown, um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in is studying these processes with relation to your own heartbeat. So how, when are you surprised about heartbeats? For instance, if your heart misses a beat, um, can you detect a surprise signal in the brain um, and can look at the regulatory responses? A lot of this is unconscious and um, that's why it's very hard 
to study if you just ask someone, did you feel your heart? And rather than doing that, um, what I try to do is use computational models and imaging techniques in a combination to get at these subconscious processing of bodily states. And uh, if you're looking for a postdoc position in the not too distant future, um, you're very welcome to contact me if you love that field. Great. <laughs> yes, feel free to advertise your incredible work. <laughs> I know that there's lots of students listening. Um, that was really, for me, that was really incredibly fascinating because, um, uh, you know, you, you, you both have this incredibly strong computational background, um, and, um, it, it makes me think that you kind of want to control a lot of the variables that you have to deal with, but you seem to be both embracing <laughs> The, the a number of a number of components and kind of this holistic approach to thinking about um you know function i mean it's it's actually quite different from my tendency which is i was like i just want to control as many variables as i can and go in and kind of look at <laughs> one of them change one of them in a very controlled way um and so as i was listening to you both and thinking like what is it that you know you both it's, uh, steph mentioned meg and eeg and I know, Enrique, you definitely use both of those uh, approaches to try and get some insight into kind of the macroscopic activity of brain function. But um, we'll get back to your, your embracement of the whole body in, in, in a little bit. But uh, it struck me as I was listening to this that, you know, I, there's so many different kinds of ways in which we look at activity generated by kind of electrical signaling. And so to the one extreme, which is what I did for my PhD is to look at currents going through one single molecule, like one ion channel and look at the transitions, the opening and closing of those, of the, of those single molecules and looking at the currents that are generated. When I see that, I think about thermodynamics you know, transitions between conformational states. But I know most people don't see that when they look at single channel recording. So like, I, I just love to get a little bit more richness from when you guys look at EG recordings or MEG recordings, like what do you, what do you see? Like, what, what do you see and where do you see the, the incredible advantage of that kind of recording, but the limitations as well? Maybe we could dig into that just a little bit. Rike, why don't you um, start off here and then we'll go to Steph. Or you can jump in and, you know, at any point, both of you. Go ahead. Um, I think it's a very good question. When I look at EEG data, I'm a bit torn <laughs> because um, the first thing I also see is the limitations. Um, I think uh, we know that we're looking at the brain in a macroscopic manner um, and that has advantages, but also a lot of disadvantages. There are certainly things that we cannot see using the signal. And also there is you have to be very careful how you analyze the data and you got to know what you're doing and slight changes can have a huge impact. Um, and I'm working a little bit in methods development and it's a messy field. Um, and there is a lot of struggle associated with this. Um, at the same time, looking at something in a macroscopic level, I think has a lot of potential because if you want to compare it to physics, for instance, um, if, you look at the microscopic level, you can look at the single atom and you can learn a lot about matter. Um, and then you have the mesoscopic level where you have thermodynamics actually most of the time. And then you look at the macroscopic level and you have a ball which consists of many, many, many atoms. And if I wanna model the trajectory of a ball, I'm not gonna model every single atom and it's impossible. So I'm using Newtonian dynamics and I can actually explain how the ball is moving. And this is my macroscopic view of the world unless the ball is moving very fast then i should use quantum dynamics but that's a different story um but um it just tells us that every level of description or every level of kind of um that you can look at you know has questions that can be asked at that particular level that are extremely meaningful and i think this is true for eeg where you really can have a window into cognition into processes overall processes that are taking place in concert in the brain by many, many neurons. And um, that is what is making it so fascinating. At the same time, it also means that you have to be aware what sort of questions you're asking when you're looking at EEG data. 
Yeah, and so to build on what Rike was saying, I agree that um, this EEG signal can be really powerful. There's lots of limitations, but I think that the limitations are actually a benefit for us because we're at the macro scale, there's a limited space of signals that we see, right? There's only so much you get outside of the head. And because of that, there's only so much we need to understand. And there are some common things that people are looking at is differences in disease states um, or healthy behavioral processes, things like changes in the frequency of a rhythm, changes in the coordination of activity across the brain. So there's a lot of low hanging fruit of commonality and differences that people are looking at that I think we can have a handle of understanding. Um, and Diane, when you said you look at a, a channel and you see thermodynamics, now when I look at an EEG, I see mechanism, right? I see that, you know, we now know that these EEG signals are primarily generated by these big apical dendrites in pyramidal neurons in the cortex. And there's these pathways of information flow into these pyramidal neurons that regulate either the sensory input from the periphery up to the cortex or the intracortical um, internal thinking processes through the different parts of the dendrite. And so those inputs drive these electrical currents in different directions. And so now when I see a signal and I look at the direction of the signal, I think, oh, that was a sensory input that pushed current flow up. Or I might see a sharp deflection and think, oh, that's caused by inhibition at the soma that's creating it. And so the more you work with these signals, the more rich that you see they are, and that you can connect them to mechanisms of brain function um, in coordination with the internal and external world. Yeah, that was, I mean, I, I think that's right. And then the other, you know, the other piece of, of, of what is, I mean, you are, I know, you know, both of you at Steph with your, um, Neurosulfur trying to make those very direct connections. It's like what's going on at the level of individual neuronal activity, even individual channels. Um, and then how do you extract that information at the level of the EEG? And so I think that that's it's it's a it's a brave it's a brave thing to do. But I've seen I did your say like chaos, working. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the other the other piece of this, of course, is that. You know, when when I do my single channel, I don't don't do it actually that much. But but when when I used to, it's like you can't. There's really no meaning in any individual event, right? It, but and so you have to collect hours if you're really interested in well, what's going on at the kind of mes you know mid level. Uh, you've got to collect hours and hours of data to pull that together to be able to see the average activity. Whereas you're seeing the this filtered out average activity, but you've got that got all of we don't have all of it. Of course you've got the dominant um neural activity that's kind of driving that. But like it just is so cool to try and think about how the that connection can be made and you gotta have models. <laughs> it's just it's just gotta be modeled. Um there is a question, then I'm gonna jump to Chris, but like one of the, you know, one of the you you're both really focused on um you, uh, looking at human brain function, I mean, is there, you know, where, where do you see the limit? Is this important, you know, for, for what you're doing? What about animal models of, of neural activity? And, um, you know, how do you think about a, a lot of what many of us do in terms of looking at um, models, you know, animal models of neural activity to what's the advantage and disadvantage and what's what's so important in terms of what you're doing? Why do you have to look look in the human brain? So maybe or do I'll you? Start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I think it's kind of obvious why we want to work with the human. I mean, at the, um, at the end of the day, I think we want to help, at least in, in my world, we're thinking about helping with disease states and understanding human behavior better and improving human behavior. And so for that, studying the human is really critical if you want to get at this level of question in humans. But, but we can't do it in isolation. And what we're really trying to do with our modeling framework is to bridge the scales from the human to the animal. The model was built based on everything we know from all the detailed studies in the animal. And then we scaled that up to try to study, well, what does this translate to in this human macro scale signal? Um, but any prediction that we make, ultimately, it has to be tested in further informed from what we can get in the animal work. And really trying to bridge you know, these two revolutions that we're having in human EEG and all this data that we have and that we can share 
because it's easy to obtain and now we have platforms for open sharing. And at the same time in the animals, I mean, the revolution in being able to genetically manipulate them and, and, and image them with all the new techniques, we're really at an interesting point where we can start to bring those two fields together. And I think modeling right. is the way to do it. And, and right. I'm not the only one that thinks that there's lots of efforts going into building these bridges across scales. And of course, some of the most important um, models you apply to early on were derived from studying squid giant axon. That's right. In, that, in the <laughs> early 1950s, late 1940s, and they still hold. And they're still unbelievably important. OK. Chris, do you want to, um, sorry, Rika, did you want to add anything to that? And then I'll shift just, over to Chris. Just to, short yeah, add-on, yeah, maybe. Um, so I think it's the, in a way, studying humans is um, the great interface between application, um, you know, in the sense that, for instance, I'm interested in mental health. And obviously, um, for instance, gambling addiction is, you can study addiction in, in um, mice models. Um, gambling addiction is a bit harder to study. Um, in an animal model. Um, psychosomatics actually also, because it's very hard to assess what, you know, how would you assess the psychosomatic symptom in a mouse? But at the same time, um, a lot of what we can learn in terms of the mechanism does come from animal models. And um, I'm really looking forward to work with Chris, um, where we try to do exactly that, you know, measure humans and at the same time replicate the same experiments, but in different animal models. And one thing one has to be aware of though, is especially with um, body regulation, is that a lot of the pathways that um, exist in humans and monkeys, they don't necessarily exist in mice. And um, especially that's true for connections to the insular cortex, which is particularly playing a role in the type of research that I do. So, um, you know, in doing these translations, there's one aspect is looking at the same computations. Another one is to understand how they are actually implemented in different species and be aware of their differences. All right, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, to, to pick up on what you just said, Rike, in, in two different ways, I, I think it, one thing that's fabulous about uh, your work and Steph's is models can really help us go where we just can't <laughs> experimentally, right? Um, and they really at least give us a well-posed guess at how to link these levels. But you're right, there's this fundamental um, limitation you can bump up against if the animal model, if, if the animal model was a perfect model, it'd be a human, right? Like, the best model for it's a, a cat is a real cat. Um, so one, one question that comes out of that is, you, you mentioned, or a related question, <clears throat> Is there these famous levels of analysis? People talk about Mars levels of computation, right? And there's this idea of, it, it somewhat maps onto your macro and meso and micro scale physics of you know, parallelism or analogy, um, where there, you know, depression is something we feel. And it's a problem because we feel a certain way and it causes us to have interruptions in our life, which we deem to be bad interruptions. That's why it's a disease and not just a state that we can experience. And a neuron is a biophysical thing as we usually con conceive of it as Steph models it you know, so nicely. Where do you see, do, do you see hope? <laughs> Maybe we'll start with you, Rike. Do you see, I, I absolutely see hope in, I, I see hope in this, but do you see hope in the ability to have those levels start really informing each other? Like, does it matter the biophysics or can we just live at the level of Newtonian? Uh, of course it matters, but you, you get what I'm trying to push at. The psychological mm -hmm. level and the neuroscientific level are famously divided in the way computation approaches them. Um, is there a window to try and make those connect? Uh, yeah, certainly, uh, I certainly think there is. And I think modeling is one of the ways to bridge these gaps. Um, it's probably one of the few ways actually to bridge these gaps unless we have, um, we develop really good new methods where we can measure at these different scales, right? But, um, you know, it's the same as in physics, actually. How do you do the translation? You invent thermodynamics. <laughs> um, and um, it, you know, allows you to bridge between the different levels of analysis. And it, this is also true in, in neuroscience, I think that, I mean, a lot of the work that I do is really at the computational level. So really at understanding 
what sort of computations is the central nervous system or the brain, you know, doing? So for instance, I see perception as a computation. You get sensory inputs um, and you process these sensory inputs in the light of your previous, previous experiences. And that um, then can also lead to action selection. And in that sense, um, that's a very high level description, but I, you know, oftentimes we're agnostic about what is the algorithm that is used, but you can actually do model selection and try to figure out what are the different algorithms? We have the methods to measure that, but we can also do things like model comparison nowadays. And I think that's a very promising development is that a model is a hypothesis. And as much as we use experiments to use um, to do hypothesis testing, we can use models to do hypothesis testing and compare one model against each other, run a proper model comparison and actually delineate different hypotheses from each other. And that I think what this means is that if you want to build models that are useful in that sense, then you have to um, propose models that make testable predictions. Um, and then really have the experimental evidence or the experimental data to, you know, put one model against the other. And I think now we start to have these computational frameworks um, and we actually start to have relatively clear predictions um, about implementation. But what we need is the rigorous experiments now to delineate between the different theories. And I think we are on the way there, but it's the very beginning, uh, in my opinion. Steph, did you um, want to chime in? I, I, I kind of lost the, the thread of the main question. Um, well, the main question was you, you could treat perception or depression as a, a completely, very usefully treated as a completely psychological, experiential phenomenon. Right. This is the ultimate mind body question. I, I'm rewarming the mind body question and putting it in the context of the cool work you guys do, because I think I think the embracing the complexity, but trying to do it in the principle with models is one of the few hopes we have for chipping away at that connection. You know, yeah. I guess I guess I'm just saying how close do you think we are if that's a long term goal? How close do you think we are in making that? Uh, I think we're getting pretty close. It and I, I think really it, the key to getting it right is asking the right question, right? How do we put the question in a framework where we could do the interesting computational, test the interesting computational theories that Rike um, and colleagues are developing about, you know, um, internal states and how they filter information and make predictions. How do we turn that into a readout in an EEG? And then from there, how do we link that to the models in the real biophysics that I'm developing. And that's going to start with the right key question. And what's one that we can then test in an animal, right? And so to get that whole link from, you know, behavior, um, psychological question to mechanism, you know, th there's going to be a, a really right path by addressing a question that we can bridge across levels. And oftentimes, you know, the question that we ask is very specific for what the machinery that we have, right? And so we're not thinking out of the box about what kind of question can I ask to bridge that machinery with this machinery in a meaningful way? And so one, one concrete example of that is, you know, we're dealing with these EEG data sets and there's all sorts of really exciting um, machine learning, artificial intelligence algorithms that are being put on these data sets to um, classify different states or different diseases. But then when you want to get to the level of mechanism, ah, there's so many levels of abstraction, even from the signal, that how do I take that information and map it back onto this waveform that I'm trying to simulate? And so asking the right question about what to look for in the data through AI, that ultimately I can then tag it back to something in the signature of the signal that I can model. And even that is a, is a hard problem because we don't know where that connection is yet. And so, and so figuring out how to go from one theoretical construct to the other is, is challenging, but I think we're there. I think we have the tools and we just need to think smart about how to start to bring them together. Yeah, I mean, one of the, I think we're gonna come back to big data in a bit, but <laughs> one of the, um, there's, a, there's a question um, that just came up and uh, about how, how do you, links very nicely to, to what you just said, Steph. It's like, how useful are human neurophysiological data um, in terms of like, you know, neurosurgical patients? Um, and if I extend it, you know, how 
useful is it to think about the information that one could get from um, you know patients who have particularly well defined disorders and there's a beautiful parallel of course with um, EKGs you know like the 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 that um and i go back to iron channels but there's certain like really <laughs> very discreet uh deficits in iron channels that you can just like you know if you're a good cardiologist you just pull that out from the you know from the ekg and you're like ah oh, you know th that has a signature you know of a of a deficit in the in the repolarizing um voltage gated potassium channel current because you know of the signature in the ekg do you see I mean, do, do you see that um, that kind of level of precision might be able to emerge from the kind of work that you're doing, Steph and, and Enrique, um, by looking at um, discrete patient populations with particular um, well-defined um, disorders? Chris mentioned depression, maybe, yeah. I mean, so, maybe in a hereditary form of depression. Like, I don't like, you know, that, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a lot of um, areas where this is already pushing forward in the world of EEG. Um, Parkinson's disease is one that we think about a lot because of these oscillations that are known to be disrupted in the Parkinsonian state when you're having an inability to move, you have an overexpression of this 20 hertz rhythm. And so right there, there's a lot that um, we know about if you look at the EEG signal and you see this aberrant beta activity, that's a, a signature of some kind of muscle impairment. Um, in anesthesia, they use different levels of EEG frequency bands to diagnose how under you are, right? And there's lots of computational modeling work that's going to try to understand, well, what's happening at the circuit level when you transition into these different anesthesia states that are reflected in these oscillations in the brain. Um, and so I think there's lots of it. And I think that's where we want to go. You know, EEG really isn't a biomarker in the sense of FDA approved biomarkers of anything but epilepsy. Um, and so there's a lot of work we can still do to understand, you know, a disease state through just getting that biomarker. And now once you're there, okay, well, what does that mean in terms of the neural circuit? And once you have something tangible in the signal to latch onto, then we can start to model it. Uh, I would, yeah, I would support that. Um, with one exception, I would say that depression is not well-defined or most of the psychiatric disorders that I'm interested in mm -hmm. are not well-defined. So I think we can get biomarkers from EEG um, and, and they're much more about mechanisms. So maybe they will inform us about computation, but these computations might not map onto the current um, you know, DSM criteria that we have or the way we tend to um, think about psychiatric disorders. There's so much comorbidity and it's highly criticized um, for well reasons. Um, there's so much overlap between different psychiatric disorders. Um, and I think we have to go beyond these categories and not try to study depression in isolation or schizophrenia in isolation, because we really don't, you know, there's so much overlap. Just look at psychosis. There's at least four different orders that have psychosis, and it's very hard to differentiate whether that's a bipolar um, psychosis or drug-induced psychosis or a psychosis due to schizophrenia. And so, um, in a way, I think the population in and of itself should be very transdiagnostic, but maybe we find subgroups that are very, very specific at the level of their computation. And so we might find subgroups within depression or within a particular category that we that haven't even defined yet where we can say, okay, this clearly has to do with NMDA receptors and this is the particular type of treatment that this subgroup of patients should get. And I think this is something that, you know, we can go beyond the category and try to go one level further down towards mechanism. And there's not necessarily a link between the categories that we have and the mechanisms that we'll find right now. Yeah, if I can <clears throat> follow up on where we are this, I really like the idea that model comparison can be one of the tools that you mentioned this, Rike. Um, you know, if you think about the, one of the related revolutions to what Steph mentioned is the revolution in being able to know an individual's genome and what's expressed and what's not for that person. And, it feels like modeling 
is our great hope to potentially for an individual get all the way from the EG up here, all the way down to the genes. Um, and it, it would have to come down to model comparison at some level, right? To, to see which wins out in linking what might be the changes the genes related to. That, that almost feels well posed. <laughs> it does feel like a big data problem and that's something you know, we can turn to, but um, do, you, do, you, do you see that as possible? Does it require that we ask exactly the right question, which I, I agree, Steph, that's super important. Like picking off the ones where we can really make progress is how we learn how to take on more complex ones, perhaps, although we can't leave those behind. Is it possible to get from genes to EG? Is that too ambitious? Are there too many paths along the way? Can models restrict that space? So I think the key first step is getting from gene to electrophysiology, right? And so do we know that this gene, uh, genetic abnormality or um, phenotype maps onto something specific in the electrical signatures of a neuron or a neural circuit or a neural transmitter? Once we get there, now we can start building up to the framework of you know, um, electrophysiology and ultimately EEG signals. But I think, you know, where we really need to be bridging the gap is understanding how those genetic changes map onto things in neurons or non-neuronal systems, things that we can model. Um, and so I think there's a lot of modeling work. I think we can get there, but there's a lot still that needs to be done at that basic level of understanding how the genes map onto different neurotransmitters and NMDA conductances. And, and maybe there's, um, and we've talked about cr this, Chris, but maybe there's a specific genetic order that we can start with, something in autism or something where we know there's kind of a, a limited direction that we can target for what the gene does abnormal cre to create an abnormality in the electrophysiology um, and, and start with kind of simple diseases or simple genetic um, abnormalities. I guess, or, or genetic traits that we can map onto that don't create this whole cascade of thing, but is there one that really we know have a well-defined path and now we can start to map it up to EG? And probably not, <laughs> not yet anyway. There's, um, Chris, there's actually a, a somewhat connected um, question that just popped up. And so maybe I'll, um, it's, it, it's quite specific, but it but it actually is linking some of the initiatives and asking how your work your work both of your um, research programs might connect to one of the initiatives that NIMH, which um, uh, you're probably way more familiar <laughs> with, it's called the RDOC initiative, which, uh, Research Domain Criteria Initiative, um, and uh, you can describe it if you. One, but essentially kind of ha creating a framework to for investigating mental disorders. And it really is is uh, resonating with a lot of the discussion going on. It's like, how do you um, establish a framework for doing this? Um, and, um, you know, going from genes to circuits to behavior. Um, and, you know, how much of what you're doing, you're both doing is really kind of related to and connected to, to that kind of, uh, of need. Um, Well, yeah, maybe as a as a quick note, <laughs> um, RDoc is um, it is trying to kind of come up with a categorization. So DSM um, traditionally it really just looks at syndromes, not just symptoms actually, but syndromes are just right. a cluster of symptoms. So if I right. kind of try to say what is schizophrenia, then I um, right. have like five symptoms that you had over the past two weeks, and if you had three out of those five, for instance then you might be diagnosed with schizophrenia. And that can lead to patients not having any overlapping symptoms, um, even though they're diagnosed with the same disorder. It can also mean that um, people with exactly the same symptoms, one responds to a treatment and one doesn't. And that's why this classical categorization, which really is based on syndromes, has been criticized. Because it's not really predictive of um, what is the best treatment for a given patient. And so RDOG is an alternative, which is much more biologically informed and also tries to kind of come up with a categorization. And so in a way, I think it's a, a definitely an improvement to um, DSM. Um, the way I try to, like RDOG does not really include 
computation in that sense yet. So when I think about mechanism and I think about the functions of the brain, I really think about the type of computations that the brain is performing. And so that's why my work is much more transdiagnostic in the sense that I try to understand what happens if um, we have maladaptive decision making or what happens if um, you know, we have a, you know, we, we tend to perceive sensory information um, more strongly or there's an overemphasis on that. So um, in that sense, it is, um, I, I see the, the benefits of the approach. My work is somewhat related, but again, in its approach, a bit different because I try to look at mechanistic explanations that rely or are based in computation. Yeah, and similar for my work. I mean, I think the computation can be in different parts of um, the RDOC model, but the whole um, integrating directly with computation and mechanistic models, it's not something that's part of that pathway yet. Um, but I think there's more and more discussion about it. Perhaps it's like the interface initiative. The leap would have been too big from DSM to computation. I don't know. <laughs> Um, Chris, what do you think? Should we, should we turn to big data or? Sure. It's a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is, um, I mean, maybe, the, you know, there is a question and again, another question in the, um, chat, which, uh, refers to, you know, AI, you know, can, can you use artificial intelligence to understand, you know, how they used human intelligence words, but but more generally, you know, what? How does the brain work? <laughs> does the brain do these complex uh, actions? And um, we we've all. I, I'll let Chris jump in, um, you know, and talk about the the, you know, the, these issues. And maybe we'll get to it if if we'll probably get to it in terms of your answers. But like, how do you how do you incorporate AI and big data into the kind of work you're doing and we had a little discussion beforehand, right? Uh, talking about how, how much do you constrain your models? How much do you let them run free? Um, how pure, <laughs> are your models pure if you do some constraining? Like, so, so tell us a little bit about how you think about the huge advantage of, of having just so much more data to, to be able to, to use in in your your comp computational kind of uh, modeling approaches, but but where do you you know where are the limitations as well? So one one exciting thing that's happening right now um, in AI and modeling is the AI is helping us with model selection, right? In in deciding what is the right parameter space, where we can now because of our computational power we can simulate all sorts of different signals. In our in our cortical model, right? I can change this parameter, run it through, and I can just let it run and run and run. And now I have all these outputs, all these waveforms, and so now I can use AI to help me match the waveform to the models or the space of models that could account for that waveform and variation in the waveform in a certain way. Um, and so I think that's really an exciting direction where we can connect the AI framework to the mechanistic framework of what we're trying to do and that that machinery can really help us with selecting the right parameter space within this very complicated model for the output that we want to see you know feed it uh, the right eeg waveform that represents the healthy behavior versus the unhealthy behavior now ai can help go in and you've simulated all these different ways to get these waveforms and pick the ones that map onto these um, phenotypes in the eeg data and so that's one where, where I think AI can really help us. Of course, the other is, you know, using AI deep neural nets as a way to understand how the brain is actually doing it. And I think there's a lot to do there to connect that level to the biophysical level. Um, and there's lots of efforts in that front too, but that's kind of a separate to, to the application that I was just talking about. Yeah, to add to that, um, I thought there were two questions and they're very different. <laughs> One is, um, can an AI kind of reproduce a human intelligence or, you know, the way, like basically can, you know, a machine think the way a human can? Um, 
And I would say, well, possibly, but you have to give it a body and you have to give it an effect, you know, an objective function. Like what is it that a human is optimizing for? I mean, we optimize for survival and which means we have to keep a lot of states um, in a specific, very narrow range. Your temperature shouldn't increase too much. Um, and these are all sorts of computations that are taking place in the brain. Another objective, part of the objective function of humans is likely reproduction, right? I mean, we want our species to, so to say, survive beyond us. So in a way, it also includes survival. And then you can argue what else is part of kind of our human objective functions, but certainly um, homeostasis is part of it. And so if you would want to have an organism or a AI that thinks the way we do, it has to have the same needs and um, try to kind of solve the same problems that we do. And we struggle with a lot of problems that you would not have to struggle with if you wouldn't have a body. <laughs> um, so wouldn't that, would that be intelligent? Yes. Would that be a human intelligence? Probably no. And then the question is, what is an emotion in a system that doesn't have a body going that a lot of the emotions that we have have their origin in bodily signals. Um, so yeah, you can emulate an emotion. Is that the same thing as experiencing the same emotion? So I think we get down a road that is, I find absolutely fascinating. I don't have an answer to, but I think uh, we should, yeah, we, we have to be very careful trying, when we use the word intelligence, artificial intelligence and human intelligence, um, because there is a reason why we call something embodied cognition. Um, yeah. But to the other question, the, the big data question, um, I think both Steph and I, we use mechanistic models, which means that the model in and of itself is a hypothesis. And there is an alternative, which um, you know, which you, people think when they hear big data, they often think of machine learning, where you really have a data-driven approach. So you use the data, and tell me, you know, are there clusters in the data? Are there patterns in the data that I can observe or some structure that I can get out of the data? Um, and, you know, typically this is referred to as not hypothesis driven, um, which doesn't mean it doesn't contain assumptions. And I think that's something that um, is really important to notice because the type of data that you put in, in and of themselves have assumptions. So um, if I want to study a deficit in learning, for instance, um, and I'm using a data set where somebody is not learning, then I can have a huge data set of many, many, many participants with this very terrible task that does not probe learning. And I will not find a difference or anything meaningful because the data I put in wasn't uh, containing any sensible information for the type of question I was asking. So you always have to be hypothesis driven. Like it doesn't, you know, it doesn't replace <laughs> science or doing your research and understanding what questions you're working on just because you're able to use a tool. Having said this, it's a very useful tool if you can ask the right questions. So I am very interested in using large data sets, um, but for a very particular reason that occurs in my research, which is that when you study perception, the way, like the way typical people study perception is, I set you in front of a computer screen and you see moving dots to the left or to the right, and you do thousands of trials. And I've done 10,000 of trials on myself. It's the most boring thing you can imagine, but it gives you extremely accurate right, readouts of perceptual processes in humans. And I call that deep data because it's, you know, it's a lot of data, but just about one individual person. And then if I want to relate this to cognition and say, okay, you know, perceptual processes have something to do with symptoms. I suddenly have to look at many, many different participants and ask, you know, how do they differ? And so suddenly I need deep data in a very wide data set. So that's a that's very specific type of big data that you need to acquire. And that's exactly what I try to do now um, by trying to put some of the experiments that we do on smartphones, because there you can acquire deep data, but you can also acquire wide data which allows us to answer questions that we had not been able to answer um, years ago. And so I think there is the huge potential for me um, in trying to get into, you know, that type of very hypothesis driven big data acquisition. Great, thanks. I'm gonna have Chris probably ask the last question that we can. We're closing up on it. <laughs> that just went by like, I don't know, so fast. Um, but. Rike, thanks for taking on the human intelligence question as well. <laughs> Chris, do you want to uh, pose a closing question? 
Yeah, can we <laughs> add another hour to the Zoom? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. the most important <laughs> question. We can. I mean, but we... <laughs> we can, that's right. So the four of us will be here. Email us if you want to join. This is just fabulous. I, so I, have, I did have one specific question uh, for Rike, but I think it's something Steph could very easily chime in on and has smarter ideas than me about it. How do we know, this goes back to the level of model appropriateness with parameter stuff, what you were mentioning. I, I could not agree more that we're just not going to solve the brain when we keep thinking of it as a computer. That's the last 50 years. The brain is a brain is how we have to model it, right? And so how do we know the right level? How do we know we've included the right level of richness of everything that's not a neuron? I think that it comes out of your parameter space question, Steph, and it goes, of course, directly to what you're saying, Rike. How, how do we know when we capture the right level of embodiment? Um, I, I know this is more of a philosophy question, but that's okay. You said you were almost a philosophy major, Rike, so you can go, go get in the DeLorean and answer from. Um, when, when do we have some kind of sense that we've gotten the right hummus, the right mixture of model components? Is there is there a way to know that definitively? It, so, either of you so dive one in. And... Thing I'll, I'll say about modeling in general is is the way you define a good model is if it makes a new prediction, right? You you develop this model to understand one phenomena, and then you perturb it in some way and make a prediction about a new phenomena. And if it can do that well, and that's a phenomena of interest, then you've got a good level of detail in your model, right? And and you can test whether it's um, can be validated or not. But I think for any model that you're going to build, it's really about its predictability and, and pushing our knowledge forward to that next level. It still might be missing something that won't answer a different question. Um, but again, defining the model and, and minimalizing it so that we can address the question of interest is, is the name of the game in computational neuroscience. We, you know, we're not going to include everything. And so what do we want to do first? And, and, and how do we want to perturb it to start is, is the question. And I, and I just want to say I'm super excited about the idea of thinking about how to connect these neural models to body models um, and other systems, because I yeah. agree that it's the forefront of, of what yeah. we should be doing next. Just understand the human brain particularly. Yeah. Rike, you've got, you can take, close us out and I'll take one minute right at the end to just say a few remarks. Go ahead. Wonderful. Just to underline that, I mean, I almost don't want to use that sentence anymore because it's, uh, it's always use this idea of every model is wrong but some are useful um, but it gets to the point of um, what Steph was saying I don't think we will know um, at least I will not know <laughs> um, when we found the right level um, of analysis and if we actually included all of the information I also wonder whether it is the most important question because the question about utility is can you do something meaningful with the knowledge that you have. So for instance, can, you know, in, in the context of mental health, can I predict what is the most likely treatment for a particular subgroup? If I haven't fully understand it to the, you know, single neuron level, but I can help someone with, I would find this very meaningful um, and a right level of analysis for this particular application. So I think there's a lot of utility that we can have without even being at the right level or without even knowing where the right level is, but asking questions um, that are meaningful. And this, but this really means we have to validate our models. It really comes down to model validation, external validation. So um, one thing, as Stephanie said, is predicting things that we haven't seen yet, you know, predicting states of the future, but also, you know, predicting um, progression dynamics. How is someone going to develop over the next couple of weeks? And this is, um, gets to one very important point that we, science needs to consider more is longitudinal studies. I think they're completely underfunded. Um, we have postdocs that last two to three years. Um, if you want to follow up on whatever it is, an animal, humans over a longer period of times, and you wanna show that you can predict something, then you gotta measure this for a little bit of time. and the funding schemes that we have do not promote that type of research. So I think it's an absolute essential kind of future directions that we should fund. <laughs> no, that's, that's really great. I mean, I think that we all know intuitively that we, we change quite a lot over the years. 
<laughs> we're not quite the same people that we were 20 years ago. This time, no. <laughs> um, thanks. That was just a thrill. Um, it was fun. It's kind of an adrenaline injection of science. <laughs> really great. We, we are really looking forward to having Rike, you here. <laughs> We're all lo looking forward to being all back in this hubbub of, of a lot of intellectual like activity and collision of ideas. Um, but this is this is a this is a great substitute, and I think a lot has come out of this really fabulous discussion. Um, Steph, there was a, actually a question we kind of jumped over, but it's from someone who wants to know how to translate "eg" into. Um, uh, be able to use your human neurosolver software and I'm going to just suggest that people kind of check your website but if they need to have questions answered I bet that there's an email address on there. Sure <laughs> yeah people. go to our website hnn.brown.edu <laughs> there's a link to uh, question and answer we'll, we'll help you out or send me an email directly and I'll forward it to the right person. Right. Thanks <laughs> but so we're eager to get the community engaged it's a newer software yeah. so please do be in touch. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so feel free to check out that software. Um, we'll have a big party when we can, when we're allowed, when we can arrives Excellent. in Rhode Island. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. It was super cool. Thanks, Chris, uh, as always. Um, and we'll be letting you all know when the next Carney Conversations um, is going to be scheduled. So just look out for that. Take care. Bye. Thank you.